When I was a boy, I attended this school, the Colegio Nacional de Buenos Aires, perhaps the most prestigious school in Argentina. Here we were taught to explore the world, to think by ourselves, to read whatever we wanted. Shortly after I left, the military dictatorship plunged Argentina in a bloodbath that lasted until 1983. To carry the wrong book meant being imprisoned, tortured, perhaps killed. Danger in a book lies in the eye of the censor. My name is Alberto Mangel. All my life I've been a reader. And now, after having lived in many parts of the world and after having spent decades in Canada, I live in France, surrounded by my books. In them, I can trace the reader's journey through history, a journey that entails this most human of creative acts. Closed-circuit television images from the Danish Embassy in Beirut, Lebanon, February 5th, 2006. Lebanese soldiers allow Muslim demonstrators to act out their collective rage. Protesters attack and burn the embassy because of editorial cartoons depicting the Prophet Mohammed published in Newlands Posten, a Danish newspaper. Denmark is one of the strongest liberal democracies on earth, where the media have long enjoyed almost complete freedom. Now, as its newest citizens arrive with their own belief systems, the country struggles with what is acceptable for publication. The debate caught fire when Newland Poston's culture editor heard that the children's writer couldn't find an illustrator for a book on the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Since certain readings of the Quran forbid depictions of the Prophet, no illustrator would take the job out of fear of reprisals. So I wrote a letter as a follow-up to this story about the children's writer to all members of, of the Danish Asso Association of Cartoonists. And out of 25 active members, 12 responded. Um, and it was an open invitation. I was not out to mock or, or satirizing or ridiculing. Uh, but because we do have a tradition of satire in Denmark, some of the cartoons are satirical. But they are very different both in, in the way they're depicting the prophet and in whom they are targeting for satire. The 72-year-old cartoonist, Kurt Vestergaard, was about to retire in 2005 when he created his cartoon of Mohammed for Fleming Rose. He's a satirical cartoonist who has never backed away from a subject. This one is the one I, I did, and I think it is the most offensive. For me, it reflects the fact that uh, there are parts of this religion, Islam, which um, may be used as spiritual ammunition by terrorists. And uh, I think I, I, I was right, because now they... Um, they threatened to kill me. The resulting riots protesting Westergaard's cartoon raged across the planet. More than 100 people were killed in the angry violence. 
The debate about whether the cartoons should have been published also raged in journalistic circles. Some governments in the Muslim world undoubtedly exploited the issue for political gain. But it's also true that millions of people did feel insulted. Did Danish freedom of expression infringe upon Islamic freedom of belief? ولكن الغربيون يرون ان الديمقراطيه يعني تقوم على الحريه المطلقه هذا ما نرفضه لا يوجد في الدنيا كلها حريه مطلقه السيارات لها قانون يعني وهي تسير في الشارع اذا الاشاره حمراء تقف البواخر في المحيطات ال- ال- الواسعه لها يعني خطوط سير الطائرات People are telling me, well, we censor ourselves every day because we don't want to offend one another. So, so in fact, a little self, self-censorship isn't so bad. It's just good manners. And my, my problem with that way of phrasing um, the, the problem is that I think there is a very important distinction to be made between, you know, good manners and self-censorship. Good manners is, as some of the cartoonists who refused to participate said, you know, we don't want to offend, so we will not participate in this. And that's fine with me. But self-censorship is when people are saying, you know, I would like to do this, but I'm not doing it because I feel intimidated and I'm afraid. And I think that is a very important distinction that goes right to the heart of what self-censorship is about. I think I have one advantage. I'm an old man, I'm 72, and and uh, at that age, you are not so much afraid anymore. If I were in my 30s, had small children, it would have been something quite different. Westergaard's readers still look forward to his cartoons, and he's more motivated than ever to create them. You can see uh, Osama bin Laden standing there beside a demonstration, USA out of Iraq, and then he says, useful idiots. I have been met with a lot of sympathy from my colleagues and the staff and the editor-in-chief here, but also in the street where I have been stopped by passers-by who said, well done, go on with that. <laughs> we, we support you, we are behind you. But there has also been shouting from, uh, from Muslims who had shouted to me, may you burn in hell. The danger is real. Westergaard and his wife have had to live in a series of safe houses protected by Danish security agents. Now we have just passed safe house number nine since November. It's difficult. Uh, You must sleep in a new bed. You must go to a new bathroom. Everything is suddenly different. And you know, this is only a period, perhaps four or three weeks, then you have got to go to another place. This is just not a Danish story. It's just not a European story. This is a global issue. In a democracy, you do have many rights. You have the right to vote. You have the right to assembly. You have the right to freedom of religion, the right to movement, and so on and so forth. But the only right you do not have in a democracy is the right not to be offended. You cannot insist on not being offended. So that's part of modernity, and it's part of living in a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society where there are so many individuals and so many groups with different thresholds of offense and, and, and what is taboo and what is not. The cartoons have now been published in several Western countries, inviting court cases claiming the contravention of hate speech laws. To date, no case has been won against their publishers.
Beyond political and religious reasons, most societies have struggled to accept what they consider taboo, fearful that readers will be corrupted by what's on the page. Gustave Flaubert's 1857 novel, Madame Bovary, marked a turning point in literary explicitness. Madame Bovary has married an older man and is desperately bored. She turns for excitement to romance novels, but she makes a mistake. Seduced by the adulterous women of the novels, she decides to emulate them, and the result, both for her and for her author, proved tragic. Emma's horse set off at a gallop. Rodolphe galloped by her side. They started together at a bound. Then at the top, suddenly the horses stopped and her large blue veil fell about her. To turn aside the branches, he passed close to her and Emma felt his knee brushing against her leg. They dismounted. She walked on in front on the moss between the path, but her long habit got in her way, although she held it up by the skirt, and Rodolphe, walking behind her, saw between the black cloth and the black shoe the fineness of her white stocking that seemed to him as if it were a part of her nakedness. He drew her further on to a small pool where duckweeds made a greenness on the water. Oh, Rodolphe, said the young woman slowly, leaning on his shoulder. The cloth of her habit caught against the velvet of his coat. She threw back her white neck, swelling with a sigh and faltering in tears, with a long shudder and hiding her face, she gave herself up to him. Over a century ago, this would have sounded scandalous to a reader, and not perhaps because of, of the words they were reading, but because of the social context in which they were read. The book that uh, Flaubert wrote with such care, trying to construct a new way of telling a romantic story, seemed scandalous, and it was deemed pornographic. The fact that a married woman would have a love affair seemed uh, unsuitable for the common reader. Bourgeois French society considered Flaubert a monster, and he was tried in January 1857. But within a month, he was cleared of all charges. Flaubert's publication of Madame Bovary sparked a revolution in writing and publishing. Realism, including a more frank representation of sex, had now established itself, and not everyone approved. Cheap paperbacks promised to deliver these novels to everyone, and with governments neither willing nor able to police the publishing scene, self-appointed censors began to appear. Anthony Comstock was one of the most aggressive censors in history. After establishing the Society for the Suppression of Vice in 1872, he spent more than four decades arresting and convicting thousands of publishers, writers, and readers. And what literature did he find corrupting? Flaubert, Balzac, Whitman, Bernard Shaw, and Tolstoy. Boccaccio's Decameron and the Arabian Nights were banned from the U.S. mails under the Comstock Law, a law that banned the mailing of lewd, indecent, filthy, or obscene material. The law still remains in place and was enforced as late as a decade ago. One man who fell afoul of Comstock's law in the 1950s and 60s is the legendary publisher Barney Rossett. 
Ross had fought to print a series of controversial writers in the United States, including the sexually explicit works of Henry Miller. I'm looking for your paper on Henry Miller versus Our Way of Life. I think Henry was printing his own stuff in Japan. What? Yeah, and denying it. You just, it did say that in the beginning that he did try to print his own books and distribute them. <laughs> but this, you could read this then. Now, with his wife Astrid, he's preparing a memoir of his decades-long battle to defy American prejudice. I would say that he drives me crazy with every morning getting up and having it like five different projects that he wants to work on, and each one becomes a priority so that it's, it's, uh, it's really, really hard to keep up with what he wants to do. Rosset focused his restless energy when he bought the Grove Press, a struggling publishing house in New York. Glamorous personalities were drawn to him, and publishing added to his already considerable family wealth. But most of all, publishing allowed him to defend his greatest passion, freedom of expression. There was anger that these things weren't available. You couldn't read books like Miller. While these books had been available for decades in other countries, the use of the old Comstock law by the Postmaster General prevented Americans from reading some of the century's greatest writers. Persistent action on a nationwide scale will be absolutely necessary for a long time to come to cope with the defiant plans of these filth racketeers to continue expanding their businesses. Whereas before, the offender usually escaped with a light fine or a jail term which meant nothing to him. Those found guilty now are apt to receive sentences up to 10 years and heavy fines. The entrenched racketeers themselves will fight it with everything at their command. This includes raising pious cries of censorship, freedom of the press, civil liberties, and so forth. I think the most cold-blooded and deliberate thing that I did. As I got to understand more and more about Henry Miller, he had a reputation as being a ne'er-do-well, as being bad, as being not a good writer, as being somebody who was just bad for the morality of the population. So I decided he was the one I was going to publish. However, Lawrence, although having somewhat the same reputation. There were a lot of people who defended him and talked about him. And my feeling was to go out and fight like hell for him. Rosset was soon embroiled in a lengthy court case to win the right to publish and distribute Lady Chatterley's Lover. Well, what about the postmaster's charges that the book is uh, filthy and obscene? Well, we, along with the, as far as we know, practically 100% of the American literary community feel that the Postmaster is completely wrong in his opinion, and we vigorously deny this assertion. He won his case against the Postmaster, but Rossett continued to be harassed by city and state authorities. On a book like Lady Chatterley, we must have had 60 or 70 separate cases. That was very expensive. The endless court appearances took their toll, and Rossett was forced to sell his property in the Hamptons to defend his books. And it just became a way of our life to try to do something about the situation that we were in. Having won the Chatterley case, Rossett was ready to publish Miller's Tropic of Cancer and take his chances. I was never worried about the danger or whatever, that here I was walking around the streets of New York with a piece of loaded dynamite, and that I didn't seem to notice it. <laughs> and everyone else was you know, running in all directions. And we sold some, and we got arrested. We got arrested by the mail, by the police, in every different way you could think of. 
Rosett was accused of publishing Tropic of Cancer solely for the money. But what turned the judge in the climactic trial was a paper Rosset had written as a high school student on Henry Miller. Henry Miller is an expatriate American, and as such, I thought it might be interesting to tell about the impression of America he received upon coming back home after a long absence. Perhaps he cannot decide satisfactorily if our way of life is worth dying for, but at least he can stimulate our thought on the subject. Rossett's lawyers argued that if he had written an essay as a 17-year-old in support of Henry Miller's art, how could he be motivated only by money publishing the book decades later? The judge said, not guilty. And I can remember going out and it was a blizzard. I was in a total state of euphoria. That was the high point of the whole goddamn thing. The tide had now turned and Rossett started winning his cases. The judges, as I remember, were pretty good by then. They were coming around to our point of view. Comstock was gone. The literature of D.H. Lawrence and Henry Miller may be widely available now, but the debate over sexual content hasn't ceased. Miller's work is now considered a classic example of serious erotic literature. But what about pornography, written material which is much more sexually explicit? Each society uniquely manages its relationship with what it deems to be pornography. Some allow freer access, some impose greater bans, Child pornography, however, is a universally reviled form of expression. Should anyone be allowed to possess it? Recently, Robin Allen Sharp has challenged Canada's child pornography laws. He argued that the short stories he had written were artistic works of his imagination and should be protected by free speech laws. I think that we should have child pornography laws that protect children and are not designed to protect the sensibilities of the righteous. The court found him guilty of possessing photographic child pornography, but upheld his right to create and read pornographic stories. <laughs> to some, denying the Holocaust is as odious as child pornography. British writer David Irving has in the past denied the Holocaust in speeches and in books. I say I'll give a thousand dollars to anyone who can find one document showing that Adolf Hitler even knew about Auschwitz. Irving was convicted and spent 10 months in an Austrian jail for glorifying the Nazi regime, which is a crime in Austria and elsewhere across Europe. For me to be standing here on trial, for an opinion I expressed 16 years ago as a historian uh, is, is ridiculous. And for, for Austria to try to pretend it's not a Nazi state in doing so is ridiculous. Although he now admits that the Holocaust occurred, Irving insists that the figure of six million Jews is only symbolic. What should be done with people like David Irving? Should we put them in prison for their opinions or should we simply fight them with facts? Perhaps the best weapons against false histories are the stories of those who were witness to humanity's worst atrocities. The book uh, translated no. to, to English? No, no, no. no. no. no. no. Elfrida Bruning has returned to the square where she witnessed one of history's most notorious book burnings 75 years ago. We have a whole group from all across Canada is going to come here in just two or three minutes. Minutes. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to take two or three minutes to just share with them some of your, your thoughts. A memorial of empty underground bookshelves commemorates the 40,000 books that were burned here. Bruning was a 22-year-old writer when the Nazis came to power in 1933. She and many of her fellow writers rejected the Nazi ideology that was poisoning their beloved Berlin. 
It's half past remembered on a cold afternoon Since we set the clocks back it gets dark so soon The fire hall clock still pretends it's the moon At half past remembered It's half past remembered Also unsere Gruppe das waren Schriftsteller, die ganz am Anfang, wie auch ich, im Anfang ihrer Entwicklung standen. Wir, waren noch, wir hatten noch kaum etwas veröffentlicht und waren unbelastet in den Augen der Nazis und wollten in Deutschland bleiben. Aber wir wollten weiterschreiben, wahrheitsgetreue Berichte, Erzählungen, Glossen, Satiren, was auch immer, über das Leben im Dritten Reich. In the chaos of Nazi Germany, Brüning and her associates lived in constant fear of arrest for their politics and for their writing. On May the 10th, 1933, Brüning heard that the Nazis were gathering in the Bevelplatz for a massive book burning. This was for her an opportunity to reunite with her fellow writers. Eines überspitzten jüdischen Intellektualismus ist nun zu Ende. einen großen Scheiterhaufen äh, dort errichtet und dann kamen die Studenten in SA-Uniform und warfen immer neue Bücher, die immer neu herangekauft wurden, in die Flammen und also, also wir, haben, wir haben uns ja ziemlich ferngehalten, wir wollten ja von diesem, von, von diesem ganzen Spektakel so wenig wie möglich sehen und äh, uns kam es ja nur darauf an, dass wir wieder in Verbindung äh, gerieten. Ja. Also sie haben alle, welche Schriftsteller, sie haben alle, also alle unsere Lieblingsautoren, äh, alles vernichtet. Und es war für uns natürlich also, vollständig. The Nazis burned books by anyone who threatened their ideology. Thomas Mann, Leo Tolstoy, Ernest Hemingway. Book burning is the ultimate form of censorship and has been practiced successfully by authoritarian regimes all over the world. Book burnings have not disappeared. People still burn the books that threaten their beliefs. It's easier to destroy something one doesn't understand than to try to understand it. That fear of the other can lead to the destruction of people as well. Writer Taslima Nasreen is conducting a series of interviews at a secret location in Paris. The Bangladeshi writer's books have angered Muslims and non-Muslims alike all across the Indian subcontinent. Nasreen has been on the run from her enemies since the early 1990s. She often needs to travel in armored sedans protected by state security agents. <laughs> Luminaries of French culture and government gather to honor Nasreen on the day she is awarded one of France's greatest literary awards, the Simone de Beauvoir Prize. En souvenir de Simone de Beauvoir, qui écrivait « La fin suprême que l'homme doit viser, c'est la liberté, seul capable de fonder la valeur de toute fin. La liberté ne sera jamais donnée, mais toujours à conquérir. Au nom de ceux dont la foi ou les convictions réprouvent la violence et abhorrent la censure, 
Au nom des femmes et des défenseurs des droits de l'homme qui partout dans le monde se battent pour la liberté, en mon nom propre, je vous souhaite, chère Taslima Nasrin, la bienvenue en France, la bienvenue à Paris. I came from Bengal. I am a Bengali writer, but I have no place in Bengal. So I'm homeless everywhere. But the people who support me, who love me, the secularist, feminist, and humanist, they are my home. They are my country. You are my home. You are my country. Thank you. Nasreen caught the attention of Bangladeshi readers in the early 1990s when she began writing a strong feminist newspaper column. Almost immediately, her writing upset the conservative public who had for so long accepted the submissive position of women and the oppression of the Hindu minority. I divorced my husband, I live alone, and I don't care, you know, what people are saying to me, and uh, I chose a man as a boyfriend, and I had sex with him, and I enjoyed that. People do not like to see a woman is strong, she is taking decision by herself, she doesn't care what people would say to her, you know. They can't stand me, they can't stand my ideas. Her debut book, Leja or Shame, told the story of the rape of a Hindu girl by a Muslim man. The government banned it, an Islamic fundamentalist group issued a death sentence against her, and she was charged with blasphemy. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands demonstrated against me. They, they demanded my execution by hanging. And the whole country was kind of paralyzed, you know. Government filed case against me on the charges of hurting religious feelings of the people. I had no other alternative but to go into hiding because prison was not safe for me. Despite Bangladesh being a democracy that protects free speech, the mob forced the government to act. The authorities put Nasreen under house arrest, ostensibly to keep her safe. At the end, I was forced to leave the country, and my five books are banned in Bangladesh. After several years of exile in Europe, Nasreen moved to Calcutta, India, just across the border from Bangladesh. Expecting to find safe haven in India, Nasreen found Muslim organizations protesting her presence and issuing more death threats against her. Eventually, the Indian government bowed to public pressure and asked Nasreen to leave. She returned to Europe, where she lives in hiding to this very day. My open is my pen. If the fundamentalists or fanatics, or the people who do not like my writings, they can come with their pen too. But problem is they come with their soul. Facing an uncertain future, Nasreem is as determined as ever to keep on writing for her readers. I think all readers should have the right to read any book they like. If it is against Islam, if it is against Christianity, if it is against anything, it's very simple, very basic human rights. Istanbul has long shared both Eastern and Western cultures. It sits on both sides of the Bosphorus River, one half in Europe, and one half in Asia. Publisher Ragoop Zarkalo has been a critic of the Turkish government for decades. From this basement, he publishes books that are highly critical of the nation's military and of Turkey's official versions of its history. 
insulting institutions like the military is illegal in Turkey under Article 301. Offenders can face years in prison. Zarkalu has recently been charged under the law for publishing a book on the Armenian genocide. Biz hep böyle kendi aydınlar, yazarlar, yayıncılar arası da sanıyorduk. Yüz kişi evet. civarı neğerse bütün ülkeye yayılmış çok talebeler, küçük memurlar filan da muhalif olduğu sürece onlara da davalar açılmış. Yani Geçen çok gün gazetede şey okudun bu. mu bir vatandaş otobüste giderken? Ya, e, ya, ya. Evet evet evet. O bir kendi kendilerine sohbet e, ederken, sohbet ederken bir polis, evet. sivil bir polis bir ileri geri bir şey. devlet aleyhinde evet. konuşuyor durduruyor diye. Falan. Otobüsü durduruyor, adamı evet. indiriyorlar. Olur. Ve 301 yani ne ilgisi Artık var değil mi? Artık sokaktaki adam bile konuşamayacak. Konuşamayacak. Yani bu tabii demokrasinin önündeki kesin bir engel. Evet. 301'in herhangi bir şekilde değiştirerek bile uygulanması Türkiye'deki demokratikleşme hareketini engelleyecektir. Dolayısıyla tamamen kaldırılması lazım. Biz anlatamadık. Kaç defa evet. bakanla evet. görüştük. Avrupa Birliği'ne gittik delegasyon evet. olarak. Hı hı. Ama bizi dinleyen yok tabii. Avrupa Birliği. We must be in struggle with the system which is authoritarian prevent liberty. They prevent that my liberty. Uh, I was a successful student. I was arrested after the army coup and put in jail. They changed my way for the life. I made a plan to be a scientist, but I must stop. I couldn't finish my PhD and I was very angry, but I, I decided to struggle for liberty for everybody, not only for my liberties, for everybody, and to make the country more possible to live in freedom. The country has been ruled by the military for decades, although they tolerate an elected legislature. The generals represent the secular values set out by Mustafa Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey by imposing its official culture on various ethnic and religious groups such as Kurds, Armenians and Greeks, the Turkish state has rarely tolerated the assertion of minority rights, nor their voices in art and literature. Although Zarkalo belongs to the Turkish majority, he's dedicated his life to telling the stories that the Turkish government denies such as the destruction of more than a million Armenians in 1915 and the ongoing persecution of Kurds inside Turkey. For publishing books on these topics, Zarkalo has been charged, convicted and jailed several times under laws that forbid anti-Turkish activities. In 1995, Zarkalo's publishing house was firebombed. They cannot prevent my uh, liberty. Uh, I will be the freest uh, man in my country in prison because my mind is free and my mind uh, didn't want to accept the bars of the thinking. Uh, so uh, we are creating, as my late wife say, our liberty, uh, our freedom. Zarkalo has recently focused on publishing Kurdish writers. Millions of Kurds live in Turkey, mostly in the south of the country. Their political movement has demanded a separate Kurdish state. In Istanbul, thousands of Kurds have found themselves herded into a ghetto called Tarlabasi, surrounded by police stations. It can be a dangerous place, but not for Zarkalo, who can visit here his Kurdish friend, Halil Ibrahim Ozkan. Bomboş. 
Ya yani içinde insan yok. Bir süre sonra bir belki burayı biri işgal edecek. Yanındakini bir yoksul. İstanbul'un en yoksul yerlerinden biri burası. Şimdi bu yeniden kitap yasakları başladı biliyor musun? Evet abi en son Mahir toplu yazılı yasaklandı. Bir de şey Avesta'ya bir dava açtılar Kürt yayın evi. O hangi kitap abi Avesta'nın? Ee, Kürt olduğu için mi yoksa başka bir şey mi? Yok Kürt sorunu ile ilgili e, birazcık böyle eleştirel perspektif var diye. Abi, Daha, bu arada yine Kürt sorunu ile çok uğraşıyorlar. İşte bizim gazete kapandı biliyorsun. Evet. evet. Alternatif bir hafta içinde. Size müracaat... Alternatif is the latest incarnation of a Kurdish newspaper that is constantly being shut down by the government. This week it's publishing out of an abandoned school. Zarkalo has seen dozens of his Kurdish colleagues killed for reporting the truth about their plight. This is all murdered journalists. The majority were disappeared and killed uh, during their work as a journalist in Kurdish region. And uh, you know some of them very young. It was paramilitary groups uh, organized uh, by the military during the Kurdish war. Especially they took target the Kurdish writers, intellectuals, or human rights activists. <laughs> Zarkalo holds the hope that his son Dennis will carry on his publishing legacy. It's a real concern since Zarkalo soon goes to trial on his Article 301 charges for publishing a book on the Armenian genocide. Ironically, the book is entitled The Truth Will Set Us Free. As a great uh, German poet said, uh, if they begin to burn the books, uh, they will, it means they will burn the man. The internet has been liberating for countless writers and readers around the world. Until recently, he would never have revealed his identity, but blogger Wael Abbas has tens of thousands of Egyptians watching the videos of police brutality he posts online. This is my blog uh, with the latest thing that I published. Here are a list of some of the, uh, the torture, the police torture videos. <laughs> Many of the videos are shot on cell phones, some by the observers, some by the perpetrators. These are police officers. They are like having fun, pretending to be shooting a movie, while the movie involves a victim, which is this guy. I think these officers were suspended for a while, which I think is not enough. Uh, the victim had to flee the country because he was under a lot of pressure. Uh, but, Through his blog, uh, Abbas gets his readers to debate what is happening inside a country that has been ruled by President Mubarak for the past three decades. Uh, we have papers that are shut down, we have journalists who do go to jail, we have even bloggers who are in jail. By revealing his identity, Abbas risks his life to communicate with his audience. His phones are tapped, no one will hire him, and the regime has attacked him relentlessly in the official media. I'm subject to a campaign of character assassination. Uh, rumors are being spread that I converted to uh, Catholicism. And again, when they wanted to add a Zionist flavor to it, they said that I converted to Protestantism. And they also spread a rumor that I was a homosexual. And so they are basically targeting people's trust in, in me and in what I write on my blog. Uh, this is a video of a microbus driver in Egypt who was sodomized inside a police station. The officers who were involved in this were convicted 
of torture and they were sent to jail for three years. And the good thing also is this video was used as evidence in the court. So it was a precedent, it was the first time in Egypt. And I feel good about it. L let me show you something that I shot myself during a demonstration. It shows how violent the uh, Egyptian police is towards uh, peaceful demonstrators. <laughs> Since going public, Abbas has not been jailed yet, nor has his website been shut down. The same cannot be said for bloggers in many other countries. Although online censorship is difficult to monitor, a few crack teams of self-described hacktivists help research which regimes are limiting access to online content. What about the um, bug tracking thing? Is that... Uh... The bug tracking thing's up and running. Ron Debert and his citizen lab in Toronto act as a watchdog agency. Once the internet was seen as this overwhelming force that governments and corporations couldn't withstand, our research has shown that states are, are intervening quite aggressively into the internet environment and shaping communications that flow through it and in fact censoring a lot of material that many people tend to be surprised about when we publish our findings not just pornography which is what most people suspect but uh, information related to political opposition to human rights to gay and lesbian information the internet is very much under threat <laughs> It's not apparent to the average user what goes on once an email is sent or a request for a website is made. But what we do is we trace that request down the fiber optic line to the router, to the internet exchange, to the internet service provider, through to the international gateway and beyond. And what we have found is that every step along the way, there are potential choke points where either a filtering system can be put in place that blocks that request from getting through, or there is some kind of surveillance system put in place that monitors the communication and can be used against people. The Citizen Lab has developed a piece of free software called Siphon that circumvents filtering and blocking efforts in countries trying to control the internet. That works by having someone in an uncensored location like say Canada or the United States, download the software on their home computer, and what it does is it turns that computer into what's known as a proxy server. And then they invite a few trusted friends or colleagues that they know personally who live in one of these countries where there is internet censorship, so that when they want to access information that is banned in their country, instead of trying to access it directly and hitting the filter, they connect to the siphon-enabled computer in another jurisdiction, which goes out and retrieves it for them. And the whole thing happens through an encrypted channel, so that from the perspective of authorities monitoring traffic, it looks for all intents and purposes like, say, a commercial transaction. We're banned in most of the places that we study. We've had uh, people who've been murdered for the work that they do. Uh, so there are some very nasty parts of the world where this type of research is considered definitely a violation of, of state security laws. There's also increased pressure on the corporations that are involved in internet censorship. And again, it's in part because of the work that we do. Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, they censor their search results in places like China differently than the Chinese government itself censors. And recently, they're filtering more than the Chinese government itself. People are wanting to hold them accountable. You know, why are you complicit in this regime that, that violates human rights? Google feels like it is Im important to engage in the marketplace and to be there because we feel that change will evolve over time 
and uh, that we feel it's important to be making that content accessible. Our choice was it was better to be there than to not be there. We're constantly orbiting around these companies and these states, uh, watching them, you know, monitoring them. After the trial, Zarkalo has been found guilty. He won't go to prison today, but he is heavily fined. We must uh, discuss uh, real democracy, and uh, we, must dis we must face with our own history for the future. Many writers uh, stop to talk anymore about politics. Uh, the system forced everybody to make auto-censorship. As long as there are those dedicated to publishing without restrictions, no matter the cost, readers will be free to read what they want. The Dublin Anarchist Book Fair is the largest and broadest radical left event in Ireland. But it's not just about books. There are gigs, parties, photo exhibitions, meetings, workshops, walking and even cycling tours all packed into a single weekend. It's a great opportunity to meet other people interested in anarchism as well as to browse radical bookstalls. You can check out the information tables of a wide range of organisations and struggles during the day and have a chat with the people involved over a, co over a coffee or a pint that evening. The Anarchist Book First sees people coming from all over the island and beyond. International speakers in the past have come from Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, the United States, from Chile, from South Africa, from Turkey and beyond. And this year promises to be no different. You can find out more about the Book Fair each year by checking the website at www.wsm.ie slash bookfair. As well as having the programme for the Book Fair that's coming up, that site also contains both audio and video from previous book fairs, so you can listen back to some of the talks and get a good idea of what to expect on the day. For social media, do a search for Dublin Anarchist Book Fair on Facebook, and you should find both the current event for this year's book fair, but also the book fair organised group that you can join between events and get early notification of when new book fairs are planned. You can help us a lot by sharing out the Book Fair event each year and letting other people know about it. On Twitter, we use the hashtag hash DABF for posting about the Book Fair. It's a pretty good tag as most of the year it's not really used by anything else. And certainly at the time of the year around the Book Fair, it gets completely dominated by discussion from the Book Fair itself and also announcements about it. Over 800 people attend the Dublin Anarchist Book Fair every year. I mean, it's a great opportunity to meet up with other people who are interested in anarchism, have a bit of a chat, find out what's happening in terms of the latest struggles, and also have one of those obscure theoretical arguments. Because the book fair has been running for over a decade now, it's also become an opportunity for old friends to meet up again, remember the struggles of the past, and find out what's happening in each other's lives. All in all, it's certainly not an event to miss. Make sure you get to this year's Dublin Anarchist Book Fair. See www.wsm.ie slash bookfair to get details of when it is on and exactly what's going to be going on. See you there.